Welcome, Dr. Glenn. I'm excited to hear about the five phases of healing today. Thank you. So this is going to be a follow-up to the last one where we talked about how Professor Vinson discovered the connection between the, the biophysics of the water in our body and the types of diseases and organisms that can grow in those terrain conditions or milieu. So we're going to start with the, the, the bottom of the, the range of health this time, starting with phase one where we have a low energy terrain where viruses can actually attach to the cell membrane because the cell doesn't have enough energy to produce a structured water layer that, that will protect it and keep viruses away. Uh, uh, so the, the way we get out of that low energy terrain is to restore the energy metabolism, which is our oxygen-based metabolism, our aerobic metabolism, where we're breaking down primarily sugars, but can break down also fats and, and amino acids, uh, and, and get ATP, the energy storage form in the cells. It's like our batteries in the cells. It's a high energy phosphate bond in the adenosine triphosphate molecule. We get 36 of those from every sugar molecule that we break down efficiently in, uh, with, with oxygen in the mitochondria. If we're not using oxygen, if we don't have oxygen available to the cell, the mitochondria has got nothing to do, it's got, it doesn't have the oxygen to work with, and we're fermenting about three versus 36, so about 10% efficiency in the cytoplasm of the cell, just in the, the solution, the, the plasma in the cell. Uh, so we need oxygen for that. We need to be able to get food, uh, you know, nutrition in there, not only the, uh, the, the, the sugar or you know, carbo carbohydrate that, that breaks down the sugar or uh, amino acid from protein or, or fats and oils, but also other, uh, other cofactors, vitamins and minerals have to get into the cell. So, so uh, circulation, which requires uh, movement, requires opening up the blood vessels. Uh, our blood vessels can get narrowed get what like, you know we know about cholesterol deposits and, and the blood vessels can narrow the the arterial or artery the small artery uh, opening so that the blood can't flow through as easily so there's there's a number of different aspects to reversing that process and it really depends on how deeply embedded we are in that like with cancer obviously in a cancer cell it's in, it maybe in the middle of a tumor and it's so surrounded by abnormal tissue it's it's in order to grow, it, it, uh, it stimulates the growth of new blood vessels, which are abnormal vessels, and there's a little complexity to what's going on there. But what they found uh, it, over the, the about 60 years of working with this method in European biological medicine is that, uh, at least in, in the beginning stages of cancer, unless it's too far gone, they are able to reverse those changes. Even going back to the 1920s, Nobel Prize winning research, that, uh, uh, the prize was given in 1931 to Otto Warburg uh, for his research showing that you could take cancer cells, get them a higher level of oxygen, and they would be able to revert back to normal cells. So, so that's the goal with self-healing and accelerating the, and supporting the process of self-healing, which is what our bodies are designed for, um, is to get the immune system in there to break down the extra proteins that are trying to seal off the tumor from the rest of the body, then the immune system can get into the, the tumor itself and, and bring oxygen. Immune cells produce uh, free radical forms of oxygen, active forms of oxygen that will break down the toxins that are stored, break down all the lactic acid that's that's the result of the uh, inefficient anaerobic metabolism where instead of you know, breaking down sugar into carbon dioxide, which is a gas, and water, which is the 99% of the molecules in our body, obviously a gas can move pretty easily through a fluid like water. Uh, it, it dissolves and forms carbonic acid, and that's how we normally get out the acids from breaking down our food. Uh, when, when that last carbon-carbon bond isn't broken, and we have uh, lactic acid, it forms a sludge, and that is the reason that that cancer cells look so different. They look bloated, they change shape, they're not normal looking cells. They're just loaded with lactic acid, which uh, 
you know, holds extra fluid as well uh, and, and makes the cell bloated and uh, changes the, the shape, the function, the pH, it becomes more acidic. So when I alkalize, another key factor in getting out of that terrain, which, uh, you know, when, when one is first studying it, it can get a little bit confusing because uh, when you look at the science of it, the measurements of the blood, which we're measuring in the venous blood, which is the, the blood coming back to the heart, back to the lungs, to pick up oxygen, to pick up nutrients, that blood is actually too alkaline, but we need more alkalinity to balance the, the acids that are staying in the cell. So it's the fact that we're building up acid in the cell, which is a waste in the cell, and we need alkaline to balance the acid in order to be able to remove it. So the reason it's a problem that in, in that phase one terrain that the blood is too alkaline is that we don't have enough alkalinity, enough of a, like calcium, magnesium, calcium being the main alkaline buffer in the body, what our bones are made out of. We start pulling it out of the bones, but we need it in the bones too. When you talk about um, acid and alkaline, is lactic acid the same as acid? It's a form of acid. It's a weak organic acid. There's hydrochloric acid. There's a strong, not inorganic acid that we make in the stomach to digest, help digest proteins. So there's different types of acids. Uh, but basically, we need to m move them out of the cells. By, by function, our cells are acid. They make acid when we use food to make energy. Acid is like the waste product that's left over. So always, if our cells are functioning and working, they're always going to be making plenty of acid. Uh, and so we need the alkalinity in order to balance that, to, to maintain that function. Otherwise, the acids build up and the cells bloat and they become degenerative or cancerous or get viral infection. So when, when we're able to move out of that zone, sometimes uh, we'll go through a healing crisis which can involve a fever. It can even involve a bacterial infection like I mentioned in the other session, about 3,000 cases on record of spontaneous remission of cancer where even metastasized cancers in some cases will spontaneously dissolve and, and disappear from the body within usually a few days. And it's always with a high fever. Uh, high fevers, 102, 103 degrees and higher, are, are characteristic of uh, bacterial infections. And it's not the infection, not the bacteria that causes a fever. People don't necessarily realize that. It's actually the immune response. Our body is designed to create a higher temperature. And one of the things that we've just recently learned about how the energy, how we get our energy level up and how that produces this layer of protective and energized water that actually stores energy and can feed that to our cellular functions is that when we, we get a fever, we, we've known for a long time that, that that speeds up our own enzyme functions, like in the white blood cells, they become much more effective. So it's like we're running fast, we're speeding up our metabolism, making our energy higher by having a fever. Well, this, the, you'd think that a lot of that heat is waste heat, and, and we do radiate some heat, but when we're radiating it within the body from every cell, it's also being absorbed by this water on the outside of the cell. And th again, this is new information because when we look you know, at our standard chemistry, we see that water doesn't absorb in, that, in those wavelengths, in those frequencies. So we would have thought in the past that, well, that's just, the energy is just flowing through and, and dissipating and being released and not being used for much. But uh, these water, structured water layers, actually absorb in the ultraviolet and the UV where normal water doesn't. It's one of the ways that they've been able to prove that, that it is a different water structure. So, uh, once we're in phase two, it's a whole different situation. We've reactivated the energy production in the mitochondria, which are bacteria that live in our cells that we inherit from our mothers. Uh, and uh, that's the terrain where other bacteria might be able to grow. And again, that's why they're associated with that shift in the terrain. It's like exchanging petri dishes in the lab. If you put a, if you put a, a virus in that 
in a petri dish where you have uh, the train uh, a petri dish for growing bacterial cultures the virus won't grow you have to have attenuated cells which are low energy cells so at what point if you are in stage one and and in a very poor condition with whatever disease you're dealing with, at what stage should you be concerned that it's a good fever or a fever um, to go to the doctor with? If I was in phase one terrain dealing with a condition that happens in phase one, that would be you know, chronic degenerative disease, maybe a chronic viral syndrome uh, or cancer. Um, typically what you'd see in the history is that that person hasn't had a fever in years. And so actually any fever would be a sign that their immune system now has enough energy to respond in a manner that it does in order to heal the body. Our body, our body is genetically designed through, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of human genetic history and millions, millions, hundreds of millions of years of life history in order to maintain health. So uh, it's, it's when we can, I believe it's, it's smart to support that process, uh, you know, with, with the usual things of water and rest and, uh, you know, not to suppress it, to not knock that fever back unless it's a risk for other reasons. You know, and you know, for the average person, they're going to want to consult with, with their doctor or, or health practitioner on, on that. Um, you know, it's 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 a judgment call. You know, if you have uh, if you have a, a fever and you suppress it, you run other risks besides the risk of preventing the healing of some either known or maybe unknown condition. You know, the flu we can take a a, a vaccine maybe and prevent getting the flu every year. If we're absolutely successful at avoiding the flu, the question is, are we running the risk of increased rates of chronic degenerative disease and cancer? And, and there's some reasons to think that we might be actually increasing our risk for other diseases. Diseases are not entirely independent of each other. If we suppress one, we may get another. And that's, you know, we know that from side effects you know, uh, of medications too, the side effects aren't are sometimes the direct toxic effects of, a, of a, a chemical drug that's toxic in itself, and sometimes the, the indirect effects where it's, like say a child with, with a, a skin condition, might use, they might uh, use uh, some s sort of a steroid cream that suppresses the skin condition, controls the inflammation there, but we know that, note that steroids also weaken the immune system and prevent whatever elimination process might be happening, and, in a later segment, we're going to talk about the layers of the, the body, how we, the body grows embryologically in different tissue layers, and how the body's designed to get toxins and irritants out from the inside and more crucial interior layers out through the more superficial layers like the skin. But a very common thing that they've seen in, in the European biological medicine would be suppression of a skin condition. And then the next thing the child comes in with is asthma, which is a deeper more serious issue. So again, the conditions aren't independent. The body, it, it, we've broken down the body by specialty. That doesn't mean that's how the body works or how it's designed to work. So uh, if, if we've, let's say we've gotten out of that low energy terrain, and again, that, that's the hardest one, the worst one, the more complex one. It's the one we're all afraid of, you know, chronic degenerative disease. Uh, uh, from atherosclerosis and, and those sort of cardiovascular issues breaking down our, our basic supply system to, to the cells uh, to cancer and arthritis and you know, very common conditions that uh, you know, the, the kinds of medical treatments that we have are designed, we call them medical management usually. It's not really a cure. It's not really a healing process. It's an attempt to control the, 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 the symptoms, the irritation of that, the pain of arthritis, or uh, you know, to, to reduce the fever with the flu. But uh, again, what we're talking about is a different idea of, of health, that our goal is to restore a higher level of health that we may have had in the past uh, or attain that health, you know, maybe we never had if we're born with, with issues. 
Uh, but usually when we're younger, we have a higher level of health and it tends to go down with age. And so we tend to associate that with aging, but it's actually age is time, time doesn't cause, it's a context. Do you think in the different levels of health and predisposition, there are people who really should consider the flu vaccine? That's, again, a judgment call. My opinion uh, is, if so, I think it would be quite rare. Uh, you know, there, there certainly are people who are infirm who are at high risk uh, of having complications with, with, a, with a flu. There's also people who have complications with vaccines. Uh, it's not, it's not, you know, nothing is completely safe in life. <laughs> uh, but if you look back at uh, historically, when when flu was one of the the, the big killers, uh, you know, back in the late teen, late eighteen hundreds, for example, when there was we still had a uh, a system of medicine in the United States that had had freedom of uh, philosophy, not not a single. Type, and which they do have in Germany, they do have in Japan, other countries these days, but the United States for the past almost 100 years has been a, a, a dominated by one single model, uh, the allopathic school of, of medicine, which uses patent drugs and surgery. Uh, if you look back at the late 1800s, there's records that show that the homeopathic hospitals, and then at that time most of the hospitals in the United States were homeopathic hospitals, they actually had a much higher survival rate in the big flu epidemics than the allopathic schools did. Now, we have different yeah. drugs in allopathy today than we did back then, but again, there's, there's some interesting clues that, that uh, for example, homeopathy, which is still today the leading form of medicine in the world in, the, in terms of numbers of people treated, uh, is, is a missing piece to the, the puzzle of how do we stimulate and support the body's healing process versus strictly using drugs that require licensing because of their risk and their toxicity uh, that tend to work by blocking pathways in the body's functional systems. The body doesn't have extra systems, just like in surgery, it doesn't have, so we're not born with extra organs very often, and yet, unfortunately, there's still this idea of preventive surgery you know, even breast surgery sometimes these days. But uh, the common thing would be removing the appendix, well, because we're in there anyway and you could have a problem with the appendix. The thing is, the appendix is not a vestigial organ as it was thought, you know, maybe 50 years ago. We now know that it's part of the immune system. It's, it's a, a, a lymph tissue. It's like a lymph filter for the colon area. And it produces compounds that it secretes into the large intestine that help regulate the bacterial balance. So it keeps harmful bacteria, colon bacteria, from getting back up into the small intestine. It's actually a very important organ for our health. Just like the tonsils. Like the tonsils and the gallbladder. And the gallbladder we need function. spleen is another one that can get taken out. That we can survive without these things, but they reduce our flexibility, they reduce our adaptability, they reduce our you know the range of conditions that we can function with and, and the quality of life. So in phase two,